Welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Tanya and I'll be the host for the webinar tonight. A special welcome and thank you to our guest speaker, speaker that's sharing the screen with me, Dr. Hussain Sidat. Eskom Surprise sorry, sorry. today with stage two load shedding um, that started this evening. And Dr. Sidat is on the eight o'clock grid, so he will aim to be finished by eight. But if you have any questions and we don't get to all those questions, please load them in the question column or the question column and we will get back to them via email. So bioactive materials is a hot topic in dentistry today and it affects different areas in dentistry with the main purpose of regeneration of the biological structure. From filling up bony defects to root repair materials, apical fill materials, up to restorative materials. I do feel that we are fast moving towards biomimetic dentistry, which means what is to copy what is lifelike when restoring damaged or broken teeth. The goal is to return the tooth to its original strength, function, and aesthetic. Dr. Sida, together with another endodontist, wrote his dissertation on MTA, and from that dissertation, three articles were published. So he has a substantial amount of knowledge and understanding on this topic. For those of you who don't know Dr. Sidat, he is a very well-known endodontist that's been practicing in Durban, KwaZulu-Natal for more than 20 years. Locally, he is referred to the endodontic homeboy. I saw Dr. Sidat recently and he said, Tanya, there's a huge mind switch in endodontic sealers and we can't go back. Once you've made the switch, you can't go back. So with that being said, Doc, I'm handing over to you. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Tanya. Can you hear me and see me? I think I lost contact for, for a minute there. Yes, see you. So, okay, okay. Yeah. thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Tanya. And uh, welcome to all my colleagues and friends. Uh, I really appreciate you joining tonight's webinar. It's a, it's, it's a real privilege for me to be presenting to you. And uh, it's, it's a topic that's uh, quite close to me because uh, as Tanya said, it was a topic uh, of my dissertation, uh, uh, Biceramics and MTA, uh, and I went into quite a bit of detail and research with it. Uh, so I hope to, in the next uh, 45 minutes uh, to an hour, share with you uh, some of the information. And uh, I am on the eight o'clock grid, uh, as Tanya said, so I want to get started as soon as possible uh, with the presentation. So Tanya, I'll be sharing my screen now. Perfect. I can see your screen. Okay, great. <clears throat> okay, so that's the topic for this evening, uh, bioceramics in endodontics. Uh, I just want to check one more time. You can hear me okay? Yes, Doc. Yes, Doc. Yes. Tanya, you can hear me okay? All yes, right, good. All right, so let's, let's go for it, guys. Uh, bioceramics in endodontics. Uh, the aim of endodontic treatment is basically uh, to prevent or heal apical periodontitis. And, and, and what we mean by this uh, is the apical infection around, uh, around the tip of the root. And if you look at uh, uh, this, this is a one-year recall that I did uh, this week uh, or, or, or on a massive infection. Actually, this was a maxillary sinusitis of endodontic origin. Uh, and uh, after one year, uh, we can see that it's completely healed up. So our, our aim uh, uh, was accomplished in this case. Now, so success depends uh, basically on two major factors. And, and the first one is disinfection of the root canal space. Uh, and we covered uh, last year uh, a webinar uh, on endodontic irrigation. Uh, and if you, if you missed it, uh, all, all you need to do is go to YouTube, uh, type in uh, contemporary endodontic irrigation, uh, and, you, uh, and you can uh, have a look at that. Uh, and today we're going to speak about the second part, that is the prevention of the reinfection of this root canal space. Uh, and how we do this uh, is by, well, actually sealing it, but, but the topic for this evening is on biologically actively sealing uh, the space. So what is a bioceramic? A bioceramic is actually a biocompatible, uh, inorganic, non-metallic material that has a ceramic as one of its constituents. 
<clears throat> it's been used since the 1960s and 70s uh, by the medical profession uh, uh, for prosthetic heart valves, uh, for uh, uh, joint replacements, uh, for, for uh, uh, cochlear implants, uh, and, and so on. Uh, but to understand the properties uh, of bioceramics, we, we have to understand uh, these three concepts. Uh, they are either bioinert, bioresorbable, uh, or bioactive. Uh, and, and just before we define each one of this, we need to understand uh, what it means uh, for a material to be osteoinductive and osteoconductive. So if, if a material is osteoinductive, uh, it has the ability to induce bo bone formation. So what it does is, is it stimulates osteoprogenitor cells uh, to form or lay down bone. And if a material is osteoconductive, uh, it has the ability for bone to grow on its surface. So if you look at the, uh, the, the first uh, pro property of, of a, bioactive, a bio ceramic material, it can be bioinert. And uh, bioinert means that there's no osteoinduction or osteoconduction. Uh, but at the same time, it allows the fibrous tissue growth around it. For example, your zirconia crowns or alumina crowns. Uh, then we get bioresorbable material. So a bioresorbable material uh, is resorbed and replaced by the host tissues. Example, uh, your calcium phosphate uh, bone cements. And then you get bioactive materials. So your bioactive materials, uh, um, uh, the examples of them are bioactive glass and calcium silicate cements, which we're going to discuss this evening. Uh, and, and, and the key property of a bioactive material is that it has the ability to form hydroxyapatite crystals on its surface when it comes into contact with tissue fluids. And these materials are both osteoinductive and osteoconductive. So, where did it begin for us uh, in endodontics? Uh, it, it began uh, uh, with this gentleman, uh, Professor Mahmoud Turbinejad. And uh, uh, Professor Turbinejad uh, is of Iranian origin, uh, and uh, he's a professor at Loma Linda University uh, in California. Uh, and he had this idea for bioceramic uh, cement um, uh, in the early 1990s. And in 1993, uh, he published his first article uh, called Sealing Ability of a Mineral Trioxide Aggregate uh, for the Repair of Lateral Root Perforation. So basically, he named the material MTA, uh, and he, uh, he used it to seal off any perforation uh, between the endodontium and the periodontium. Uh, because before that, uh, we didn't have such a material that would set in a moist environment. Uh, we had materials that would uh, basically undergo acid-base reactions, not hydration reactions. And, and what it is essentially, uh, what it was essentially is uh, Portland cement, uh, and he added bismuth oxide to it, um, and voila, he, I mean, it was a material uh, that, that set perfectly uh, in the presence of moisture and blood. Um, and uh, it, he... Uh, uh, in, by 1998, uh, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration uh, approved its use for, uh, for commercial purposes. Uh, and uh, the, the initial prototype uh, was, was gray MTA. And, and what it was, uh, essentially, it was Portland cement uh, plus bismuth oxide. And we know this because we, when we study the, 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 the original patent, uh, as we see, it's, it, it says clearly that it comprises Portland cement. So, uh, mineral trioxide aggregate is a hydraulic calcium silicate cement. And we say hydraulic uh, because it requires moisture water uh, for its setting reaction. Um, it sets in the presence of moisture, including blood. And once it sets, uh, it is insoluble. Um, then uh, they, we, we, we found uh, over the years that uh, there, there was a lot of staining caused uh, by the original gray pro root MTA. So in 2002, uh, they came out with white pro root MTA. So white pro root MTA, uh, it, it removed uh, the aluminium, magnesium, and iron, uh, and they call it a tooth colored formula. But unfortunately, it's still stained because what they realized at the later stage was that uh, it was actually the bismuth oxide that was causing uh, the staining reaction uh, in the MTA. So 
the MTA, when, when it, it undergoes two reactions uh, in the body, the first is a hydration reaction. So when it undergoes a hydration reaction, uh, it, it, it combines with water and it forms a calcium silicate hydrate gel. And when this solidifies, it forms a crystal. And if you look at this, uh, the scanning electron microscope pick, basically, it, and this is an important concept to, uh, to understand, to understand the properties of this material and, the, the, and how it interacts with, with the other materials that we use, it basically is comprised uh, of two crystals, uh, a cubic crystal um, and uh, a needle-like crystal. So the needle-like crystals are in between the cubic crystals and they, they lend it support. Uh, and, and, and basically we have a homogeneous mixture of cubic crystals and needle-like crystals. After it forms these crystals, when it comes into contact uh, with tissue fluids, it actually draws the phosphate uh, from them uh, and, and it forms hydroxyapatite crystals. So the hydroxyapatite crystals form on the MTA crystal itself. Um, and this increases the adhesion uh, with, with, with dentine. So the, the great benefits uh, of MTA uh, were, if you can summarize it in six quick points, uh, that they are, it's, it sets in a moist environment, including blood. It has an excellent sealing ability because they found that it actually forms a biological seal uh, with dentine and with surrounding tissues. Uh, and that's because of the hydroxyapatite crystals. Uh, it's uh, completely biocompatible. Uh, it's bioactive, uh, as we said, uh, and it's heart tissue conductive and, and heart tissue inductive. Uh, so it stimulates osteogenesis, not only osteogenesis, but also cementogenesis. So we see cementum formation around it as well. And it's highly antibacterial because it has a pH of 12.5 point setting. So the drawbacks were uh, the, the cost, uh, and that's still a drawback up until today. Uh, there's no known solvent, uh, even today, uh, discoloration potential uh, that we've uh, managed to take care of at this point in time. Uh, long, uh, long setting time, uh, we have uh, materials nowadays with quicker setting times and difficult handling properties. I think the materials that are being developed uh, uh, nowadays have far easier handling properties than the origin, original slurry paste uh, uh, that, uh, that, we, that we were dealing with. And also washout. So washout Basically, was when it was in an area with a high blood flow, the, 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 for example, in apicectomy cases, uh, the blood uh, washed out the, the MTA quite easily. So the material basically started evolving. And if we look at the evolution of it, uh, soon after uh, Densply came out with ProRoot MTA, uh, then Angelus uh, came out with their product, MTA Angelus. Uh, and it was a very simple mixture. Uh, it was 80% Portland cement, 20% uh, uh, bismuth oxide, uh, and the calcium sulfate was removed uh, to decrease the setting time. Uh, then uh, uh, Avalon uh, Biomed uh, came up with uh, uh, MTA Plus. Now MTA Plus, uh, this was this this, this was uh, quite a good development because uh, they came up with a liquid uh, uh, that they call an anti-washout gel. And that anti-washout gel uh, prevented uh, it from being, it gave it uh, more viscosity and it prevented it from being washed out uh, in, in these apicectomy areas or high blood flow areas. And, and where they got the technology uh, was uh, from, uh, uh, from, from, from the uh, uh, cement that was used uh, to construct uh, underwater bridges. Uh, so it was basically the same uh, material that they used uh, in the cement from underwater bridges uh, that, that, that we borrowed and increased the viscosity. Uh, the next was uh, Neo MTA Plus and Neo MTA Plus. Now, now at this stage, now we start, we, we realized that the, the bismuth oxide was causing the staining. So the bismuth oxide was removed and tantulum uh, uh, dioxide uh, is actually what it is, uh, was introduced. Uh, as, as a radioactive marker. And so nowadays for most anterior cases, I use Neo MTA plus. Uh, then there was biodentine and biodentine is an excellent material. This was a, a, a good uh, dentine replacement uh, material. It's a, it's a synthetic calcium silicate cement. It, it uh, lacks a lot of the metals uh, that the traditional MTAs have. And here they use zirconia dioxide for radio opacity. It also uh, claims to have a very quick set of uh, 12 minutes uh, it comes in a powder, uh, which is in a capsule, 
uh, and a liquid uh, that has a setting accelerator, uh, calcium chloride, and yeah, it also has a water reducing agent, so it doesn't require as much water for its set. Um, I, I think it's a great material. Uh, I think the disadvantage uh, is that there's a lot of wastage because uh, usually we just require a little bit of uh, MTA, a little bit of calcium silicate cement. Uh, but in, the, in these instances, we have to mix the whole capsule uh, with the liquid. And, and sometimes I end up just opening up the capsule and mixing it with water if I require. Uh, and I find it works just as good. Uh, uh, then we had uh, MTA flow, and this is uh, actually uh, also a very nice development because uh, this uh, allowed MTA to be placed uh, and uh, to be applied more easily because uh, we had different uh, mixtures, uh, that, that different uh, consistency of mixtures uh, that, that can be used for different purposes, uh, and it can, can be placed into a skinny syringe if required uh, with a navy tip and injected into a canal. Uh, or one of these uh, uh, larger cannula uh, syringe tips uh, to apply for perforation areas. And I've got a video uh, not far down the line here uh, where I'll, uh, I'll show you an application of that. Uh, so let's, let's look at a few clinical uses uh, of MTA. So essentially, uh, there are uh, six clinical uses of MTA. Uh, we, can, we can classify them as uh, being either intracoronal intra-radicular that is within the root and extra-radicular on the outside. So if we're looking at the extra-radicular, uh, it would be our perforation. So that is when we drill through uh, the root or the furcation area into the surrounding uh, bone. Uh, so that's a perforation repair. Uh, we can use it as a root end filling during apicectomy. Uh, intra-radicular will be an apical plug or apical barrier formation, for example, in open APC cases. Uh, a root canal sealer, which we're going to discuss last, um, and uh, intracoronal, either for pulp capping or pulpotomy, uh, and for regenerative treatment, which is uh, an excellent option uh, for, for certain cases, and we'll go through that uh, soon. So pulp cap or pulpotomy, um, yeah, it's an excellent material uh, for to use uh, for pulp capping. Uh, uh, the, this is one that I did uh, recently. I used biodentine. Um, and, and, I, and I like using biodentine in this case here because uh, it, it, it replaces the dentine quite well. Um, and and the, the major advantage of it uh, is the quality of the dentine bridge. It, it forms a superior quality of dentine uh, uh, bridge formation. Uh, um, pulpotomy. Uh, 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 this was a trauma case I saw many years ago. Uh, I think it was more than 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, the, the tooth was, uh, was, was broken quite badly. Uh, it was more than just a pinpoint exposure. Uh, I did a pulpotomy at that case. And, you know, it was, uh, I, I didn't see the patient uh, at, until about five or six years later. When you look at about five, this was at least five or six years later that I saw this patient. Uh, and it's a fantastic dentine bridge uh, and uh, no, no pathology. So, and that patient wanted some aesthetic uh, work done on that tooth. Uh, regenerative treatment. So regenerative treatment uh, is, uh, is an excellent option uh, if you have a tooth with an open apex uh, necrotic pulp. Um, and, and this was a case, uh, uh, basically an immature apex. So this was a case that, that this was a trauma case uh, which a dentist had seen. Uh, patient uh, fell off the bicycle. Uh, this was also uh, quite a few years ago. And uh, the dentist actually extirpated. So the, the dentist removed the nerve tissue uh, from the chamber. So when he phoned me, then I, I realized that my chance of doing uh, um, a pulp cap or pulpotomy are out. And I thought, uh, let's just have a go at regenerative treatment. Now he's already extirpated the pulp. So, so, uh, so basically, a regenerative treatment uh, is, is quite simple. It's very, very straightforward. Uh, it, does, it doesn't need to be referred to an endodontist. It's, I, I think all uh, practitioners can manage this quite easily. Um, uh, basically, on the first visit, uh, we and, and basically on the first visit, uh, we apply a triple antibiotic paste that's after irrigation with a one one point five percent sodium hypochlorite solution, uh, and the triple antibiotic paste is uh, ciprofloxacin, uh, minocycline. Uh, and, and metronidazole. And nowadays I use a double antibiotic paste because the, the, the minocycline uh, 
uh, or tetracycline um, can cause staining uh, to, uh, to the tooth and I find that it works uh, equally well. Um, leave that in for about three or four weeks and, and one has to take a lot of care to ensure uh, uh, that there's no instrumentation or minimal instrumentation. We don't want to upset uh, the stem cells uh, at the apex or, or any stem cells that have survived uh, within the canal. So uh, on the next visit, uh, we stimulate a bleed uh, um, and uh, the, 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 when, the, when, the, when the blood fills the, the chamber, we pack MTA uh, coronally, uh, restore, and then we wait. And we look at this case uh, about a year later, we find that the apex is closed perfectly, nice uh, dentine bridge formation after the MTA. Um, here's another one. Uh, this one uh, I did with uh, 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 biodentine. Uh, ended up packing the biodentine. It's actually nice to use a collagen barrier so that you don't pack uh, your biodentine or your MTA too far into the canal. Uh, like I did in this case, because as you can see the, the, the dentine barrier formed a bit far down, but still we accomplished our result. The, 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 the root thickened uh, and uh, uh, the apex uh, closed off. Uh, and if you look at uh, this study, this is the uh, Mahindol study, um, uh, it shows that uh, we, with the regenerative treatment, we get periapical healing, and there's a 15% increase in root length and a 29% increase uh, in root width on average. So, the next is uh, apical barrier formation. So this is in uh, open APC cases. And uh, in open APC cases, uh, my irrigation protocol uh, is with endovac. Uh, I, feel, uh, I feel safe using endovac in, in these scenarios. Uh, and uh, it, I, I know for sure that it thoroughly uh, disinfects uh, that canal space. Um, and usually I, I use uh, Neo-MTA plus because of the tantalum dioxide, so there's no, there's no staining. Uh, and uh, I used to use the MAP system or, uh, to, to place the MTA, but I found that the tips block easy. Nowadays, I just uh, buy these disposable uh, carriers and use them until they get blocked. Um, I find it much easier. This is from Pactend. Or you can inject uh, MTA flow. Uh, yeah, yeah, as an apical barrier, you just got to be careful uh, not to put too much uh, because you can easily fill the canal uh, with it if, you, if it's not controlled and or not being done uh, under magnification. Uh, this is a case that was referred uh, uh, by a periodontist uh, where there was infection uh, apically. Actually, uh, this patient had a, had a post crown uh, endo and he had an episectomy done as well. Uh, and, and there was massive infection and the periodontist was concerned uh, about it affecting the implant. So uh, I dismantled this, um, uh, medicated, uh, and, and a few weeks later I, I used uh, MTA flow in this area. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, one year down the line, we've got complete uh, healing. So you can just see the osteogenesis uh, that's occurred uh, around that APC or apex. Uh, root end filling, uh, this is one of its uh, primary intentions and that, uh, this was an article that we, uh, we published, this, this case was done uh, uh, by Professor van der Pfeiffer, uh, who was my supervisor for the dissertation and, and, and uh, uh, it, it, I, if I recall correctly, the, in, this, in this instance he used MTA flow uh, uh, as a root end filling material. Uh, Perforation repair, um, look, it, it, it happens here, you know, and this, this was a case that uh, it happens to all of us actually. I'll show you another case where it happened to me. Uh, I hope, thankfully, it doesn't happen often, but uh, every now and again, we can expect uh, to have it. And, and the good thing is that nowadays we have the material that can solve this problem. So uh, here, the dentist was looking for the canal, uh, uh, managed to locate a, 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 a a perforation, um, CBCT shows exactly where it is, and um, basically I, I located the, the other two canals, uh, I instrumented them, uh, and I use only sterile water in this case. I just use sterile water so I don't interfere with that perforated area. Uh, I don't want to put any chemicals in there, any hypochlorite or EDTA. Uh, and, I, and in this instance, uh, I used MTA flow in a, in a, in a skinny, skinny syringe.
and easily injected it into that area and just uh, packed it with a micro brush. So, so in these cases here, uh, um, you can apply a, a moist cotton pellet uh, uh, and close up and call the patient, recall the patient, uh, just ensure that it's completely set. Uh, uh, then remove the Teflon tape uh, and, and irrigate and disinfect those other canals thoroughly. Uh, and it was nicely sealed off. And you see here's our uh, perforation repair in that area. Uh, this was a case where I think I was just having a, 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 a not a good day uh, where I thought this was a walk in the park uh, endo and I just went ahead uh, drilled and uh, I saw that the, the bleed, you know that feeling, you know when you see that bleed and it just doesn't look right, it doesn't look like it's coming from the pulp chamber, uh, uh, took an x-ray, uh, identified it as a perforation, I just did a, a, a quick uh, CDCT to check uh, where I was and uh, managed to relocate the canal and I repaired this with uh, biodentine. And uh, uh, the last function, uh, and this is what we're going to speak about uh, uh, in a bit more detail uh, now, are the, the bioceramic sealers. So the sealer is the last, uh, last uh, uh, function of uh, bioceramics in endodontics. Uh, and it's really the evolution of the product because it, it, it had uh, such a good effect uh, on the surrounding tissues. Uh, uh, you know, we, we figured why not use it uh, as a sealer. So let's, let's look at the objectives of obturation. There are three objectives of obturation. One uh, is to create a tight uh, apical seal, a good coronal seal, and we need to isolate any surviving microbes. So we know that as, as, as well as we disinfect the canal, there will be survivors. And whatever, whatever has to be, uh, whatever survives uh, has to remain entombed within the root canal system. Uh, because if there's any apical percolation of uh, fluids, it can nourish those microbes uh, and it can contribute to a periapical infection. Um, and over the years, uh, there, there have been many sealers that, that are on the market and all of them uh, had one very big shortcoming and that was shrinkage. So we, we look at our zinc oxide based uh, sealers, calcium hydroxide sealers, glass ionomer sealers, uh, all of them uh, showed uh, shrinkage. And on this graph, we find that our epoxy resin based sealers uh, showed actually uh, some expansion. But uh, if we looked uh, a bit closer into the literature, uh, we see that there's uh, there's actually um, the, the 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 we find that the epoxy resin based sealers expand slightly before shrinking, so that makes a difference uh, to our overall outcome because if we look at this uh, SEM uh, micrograph, we find that uh, with the with our resin sealer or epoxy resin sealer we've got gutta percha we've got our sealer we've got our dentine so it undergoes that expansion and once it after it undergoes that expansion it starts to undergo a slight a bit of shrinkage and that makes a difference. So that's going to leave a bit of space between it and the dentine uh, and also between the gutta percha uh, and the sealer. Uh, and this is where the microbes uh, can take over if we don't have a good coronal seal uh, or a good apical seal. So any apical percolation of fluid are going to feed microbes uh, and, and uh, allow them to multiply. So how did we, over these last few decades, compensate for the shortcoming of the shrinkage? We've always known uh, that the seal is uh, uh, shrank. And, and the way that we did it was by creating a minimal sealer interface. So we wanted our sealer layer, which was the weakest link in the chain uh, of, of our obturation, uh, to be as minimal or thin as possible. And uh, we did it with cold lateral condensation, um, uh, but generally we found that we had a, uh, quite an uh, inhomogeneous uh, seal and also a very high risk of root fracture uh, with cold lateral condensation technique because our spreader used to apply a lot of force on a concentrated uh, point on the root dentine. Uh, then uh, uh, Shilder uh, uh, developed a warm vertical condensation uh, technique uh, which carried uh, the, from the 70s right up until now. I, I, I'm, I'm a fanatic of, of the warm vertical condensation technique. Uh, I've been using it uh, for, for the past decade uh, and I enjoy it very much. Uh, and so to, 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 to 
create that mindset uh, to change to a new technique uh, was not easy. But after, after researching and looking at the literature, uh, it makes actually more sense to move away from this technique or to use this technique selectively. Um, so what, what, what does it entail? Basically, we use a heated plugger. We, so we apply our, our GP, a heated plugger to within five millimeters uh, of the apex, uh, compact uh, the, the GP. So we've got a minimal uh, sealer interface. Uh, and we got maximum GP, GP. So basically, what we're doing is we're making the GP more pliable, uh, and then we backfill uh, with uh, some thermoplastic GP. And, and the problems there were actually there. There actually are two problems. So when, when the GP cools, uh, it shrinks, and when the sealer shrinks, um, that combined with the sealer shrinkage can create more voids. And also, in order to do this process. A very large taper is required uh, to get our heated plugger far down the canal. Uh, and, and, and I mean, here, here's an endo uh, that I did uh, about 10 years ago. Um, and it was decent at the time. Uh, I saw this patient just a month ago uh, with a fracture because a lot of the pericervical den team uh, had been destroyed in this case. Um, so the, the, the next uh, technique that was used uh, to try and compensate was the carrier-based technique uh, or, or, or thermophil. Uh, I, I'm not a big fan of this, uh, I think mostly because uh, it, it's a real struggle to, uh, to retreat. Um, so I try, to, uh, I, I try to avoid this technique as far as possible. Uh, now, uh, now we have the now now we are trying to compensate by using the bioceramic sealers and and what we've done the bio the, the bioceramic sealers basically the rheology of the MTA uh, has been uh, adjusted uh, to allow to give it more of a flow property um, and make it more fluid and the first generation of the MTA uh, the particle size was quite large so it was anything between 1.5 to 160 microns, so it gives you a very poor flow. And, and, and the attempt that was made to improve the flow of this material uh, was by basically adding it uh, to salicyclic resin, and we create uh, uh, materials like MTA Philippex. And so there's a lot of these bioceramic, uh, so-called hybrid bioceramic uh, sealers uh, that are on the market. Uh, and um, you know, if we find that it's in, in, a, in a dual paste uh, system, uh, then we, we must be wary because it's the, the pure bioceramic sealers and a single paste system. Uh, so, uh, and also the other thing about the salicyclic resin is, is we don't know uh, how much of uh, the, the, the effect of the MTA gets lost uh, in the resin after it sets because it doesn't really uh, encounter a, a hydration reaction. Uh, then the MTA sealers, the pure bioceramic sealers was uh, first developed in uh, 2007. Uh, and here, nanotechnology was used to decrease the particle size to below two microns, to give it a good flow. And the first one on the market was the endo sequence uh, BC sealer. Um, uh, and, 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 and the whole idea here was that it was pre-mixed, uh, and when it was introduced into the, into the root canal, it used the water from the dentinal tubules uh, to, for the for hydration reaction, and then it formed hydroxyapatite. Uh, which helped its adhesion to the dentinal wall. Uh, and the best part about it uh, is that it undergoes no shrinkage. So just like MTA, uh, it, it, it is it's quite uh, uh, dimensionally stable. Uh, and in fact, it expands uh, slightly just by 0.2%, just to improve the seal. Um, uh, this, and it's also marketed as a total full uh, BC sealer uh, by FKG. Uh, which is a calcium silicate phosphate based cement, and, and it, these are single component uh, bioceramic sealers. Um, recently, uh, uh, Total Full has come up with a high flow, uh, and, and this they, they, they claim can be used with heat. Uh, and um, uh, my experience with a bioceramic sealer, uh, I, I have never used this one. I, I went straight for this because I'm a heat junkie. I'm still, uh, you know, it still took me time. Uh, or it's taking me time uh, to move away uh, from heat, and I, I, I use both techniques the, uh, currently in practice. 
Uh, and then we have the BioC sealer by Angelus that was also uh, introduced uh, recently. Um, uh, and essentially, it's it's uh, the the com the components are the same. The tricalcium silicate, dicalcium silicate. Uh, they've got uh, zirconium oxide uh, as as uh, for radio opacity, uh, rheology agents, um, and uh, the particle size is less than two microns, uh, and it has an excellent flow. Uh, this is one that uh, I'm quite excited about. The BioC repairs cement. Uh, we haven't got it as yet. Uh, but it should be uh, it should be coming soon, and I think uh, this may replace uh, actual actually using MTA uh, in practice because uh, it's premixed MTA uh, in a putty form, uh, so uh, the it, uh, the application will be quite simple. Um, so let's let's look at the environmental impact uh, on that MTA crystal uh, that forms. Uh, within the root canal space um, because there are certain things that we do or use uh, that, that that can affect it so the first one that we need to speak about is the pH so if the pH uh, is less than nine then what we find is that we have uh, an absence uh, of needle like crystals uh, because you remember that the, the 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 MTA is made up of cubic crystals uh, and needle a needle like crystal so so if if the pH is very uh, if, if the pH is acidic uh, we're not going to have the needle like crystals forming just the cubic crystals um, uh, so so in many cases that are infected uh, I like to medicate with calcium hydroxide first uh, get the pH balance right because the MTA may not set uh, the next is storage temperature any MTA cement should never be stored uh, uh, in the refrigerator. Uh, there's a, a study that showed uh, that when it was uh, uh, stored at four degrees Celsius, uh, it formed very short needle-like crystals, uh, and this caused weak interlocking with the cubic crystals. We have a very, uh, a very weak uh, MTA. Um, uh, when it was stored between 25 to 40 degrees Celsius uh, at room temperature, uh, we get a more homogeneous uh, crystal structure. Uh, the next is sodium hypochlorite. So if it is mixed with sodium hypochlorite, it uh, was found to, to have a reduced uh, compressive strength. Uh, and uh, so uh, one should avoid uh, having any sodium hypochlorite left behind in the canals. Uh, and the next is EDTA. So EDTA is a chelating agent uh, and, it, and it draws calcium. So what it does essentially is it interferes with the formation of that calcium silicate hydrate gel. And uh, unfortunately, when EDTA, there was the studies that show that when EDTA is mixed uh, with MTA, there is no crystal formation. You just get a granular structure. So uh, it's, 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 not a, it's not a good MTA that this crystal is not going to form and uh, we, we're not going to have the desired effect. So I think uh, EDTA needs to, needs to be eliminated. The next is uh, ethanol. Uh, and if ethanol uh, yeah, is used, it tends to dry out the dentinal tubules and it affects the setting reaction because you must remember we, we depend a lot uh, on the hydration reaction uh, or the water within the dentinal tubules. So I think uh, ethanol is a no-no in the canal uh, if you're using a bioceramic cedar uh, or if, uh, if you are using it, I think uh, what, what, I, what I've gotten into the habit of doing now uh, at the end of my irrigation protocol is to introduce sterile water into the, the canals uh, uh, and I activate that sterile water. You can activate it with your ultrasonics, uh, with your cone pumping, uh, if you're using eddy tips, um, you know, whatever form of activation you do, activate it so that, so that it gets into all the little corners and gets out uh, all, all the, the, the EDTA, sodium hypochlorite, anything that may remain behind and, and affect uh, the structure of it. Uh, why I moved uh, to bioceramic sealers, uh, let's summarize the, the benefits. It's hydrophilic and hydraulic, so it requires moisture to set. Um, it's dimensionally stable. Uh, it, it expands slightly on, on setting, 0.2%. Uh, and once it's set, it's insoluble. And while it's setting, it has a very high pH that's above 12, so that makes it antibacterial. And one, when, it, when it's set, it's biocompatible. Uh, and bioactive. And when it comes into contact uh, with tissue fluids, 
uh, it releases calcium hydroxide, and this calcium hydroxide interacts with phosphates uh, and forms hydroxyapatite. There are two clinical techniques uh, currently advocated for using bioceramic sealers. Uh, one is cold hydraulic condensation, and this is the one that is most uh, recommended. And, and because uh, the developers um, are aware that there are uh, endodontists out there that are heat junkies and have been using uh, the, the shielder technique for so many years, uh, the move was made, uh, I feel, to develop uh, something to appease uh, us and create a my, uh, um, MTA sealers uh, that can work with heat. Uh, uh, but the, the technique is, 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 is referred to as mild warm compaction, so it's not warm vertical condensation. So there is, a, there is, quite, a, there is quite a difference between the two, and we're gonna, we're gonna go through that now. So <coughs> let's look at uh, the first technique, the cold hydraulic condensation. Uh, the first thing we do is uh, we do our trial fit of our GP. Uh, uh, the recommendation uh, is to apply the tip up until the point where it binds uh, and to inject and withdraw uh, so that you don't uh, extrude the material out the apex. Uh, and here's, here's, a, a, um, here's a very nice tip I picked up from uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this literature that I went through, uh, and that was uh, not to waste the material that's uh, in the delivery tip. So uh, basically disconnect it, uh, make sure you cover the, uh, cover the tube because the moisture in the environment mustn't initiate the set uh, of the remaining MTA, uh, remaining uh, sealer inside uh, the, the tube. And, and basically you can dip a lentulo spiral uh, or uh, I, I use uh, files, uh, endodontic files that I, that I no longer want to use that are, that are sterilized. Uh, I dip it in uh, and, and, and I run it into the canal um, uh, in, in reverse uh, and just, just to make sure that the, the walls are coated entirely. Um, and then uh, you can dip your GP cone in. So there's actually very little wastage here because you dip your GP cone in uh, and then insert it into the canal uh, and the job is done. So you just uh, burn off the edge uh, and that's it. So the, the, the concept here uh, is actually, this is where uh, the, the, the mindset uh, has to change because uh, traditionally uh, we had a maximum GP as our core and a minimum sealer interface. Uh, and now uh, the, the, the move is uh, towards having a maximum sealer uh, and minimum uh, central core. So <coughs> your, your, the function of your GP uh, is just to apply that hy hydraulic uh, uh, force so that the, the, the sealer can go into all the little uh, areas, into the, in, in the, all the irregularities of the canal. Um, and also it allows you an opportunity to retreat uh, if necessary. Uh, let's look at mild war, uh, warm uh, vertical compaction. Uh, here, uh, the heated plugger uh, uh, shouldn't be above 150 degrees Celsius. Uh, the, the, the product says that it can be used at 200, but I think 150 is sufficient. Um, and it shouldn't uh, go to within five millimeters of the apex. The, the maximum you should go to is about halfway uh, down, so the midpoint of the root, uh, or even seven to eight millimeters from the apex. So you don't have to you don't have to insert it uh, that far down. Uh, so we want uh, a bit of vertical compaction there, uh, compact and backfill. Uh, and let's look at the case. Uh, just another little tip. Uh, I find that uh, I have quite a few leftover of these uh, tips. Uh, and so I connect them to a surgical uh, suction and I use them uh, to dry the, uh, dry the canals. It works quite well. <laughs> and uh, here I'm injecting the uh, bio -C sealer uh, into the canal. You can see there's a communication and it's filling that, uh, that isthmus area quite nicely. <coughs> uh, 
tip my GP cone. And I and just just uh, insert it into the canal, uh, and there's one more GP cone to go uh, alongside it, uh, and the job is done. And and that's that that's the finish basically. So this was just uh, a cold uh, hydraulic uh, condensation with with sealer and GP cone. Uh, so we're going to go through some cases, uh, and all my cases uh, that I show you now are, are carried out with uh, HyFlex EDM files, uh, and uh, we have a tentative uh, date booked uh, for, I think it's the 7th of April, uh, where we're going to be doing a HyFlex uh, webinar, uh, so yeah, keep an eye open on, for, for, for that. Uh, let's, let's look at some cases. So, so, so in my practice, uh, I, I, I use uh, either the BioC sealer, uh, or the total full BC sealer, the uh, the high flow one, uh, and and that's because uh, I, from time to time uh, I alternate between heat uh, and la, la, uh, uh, hydraulic uh, cold hydraulic uh, condensation. So this one I, I did with uh, the, the the high flow material. Uh, the this premolar was also done with the high flow, uh, and especially in areas uh, where I want to place a, a post. Uh, I make sure I do a, a, a warm vertical compaction in that area um, because I think if we just do the cold uh, uh, condensation, then we're going to have to uh, wait for the material to set uh, and, and then do, do the post placement at, at a central visit. Uh, this was also done uh, by high flow, a nice C shaped uh, canal here, a lot of irregularities. Um, also with the high flow. And uh, this this was a case uh, with the bio CC lens because I've, I've been using uh, these materials for just the last say five or uh, five or six months. Uh, I don't have uh, many recalls as yet. This one I'm very curious to wait for the recall because I want to see if this uh, maxillary sinusitis of uh, endodontic origin uh, heals or not. Yeah, that this this. Uh, pulp chamber was quite drilled out. Uh, the dentist couldn't locate one of the canals, and uh, uh, I, I, I use the bio sealer when obturating. So I'll be keeping an eye open here for this when the patient is recalled. This one here is another case with bio C also waiting for healing. A lot of bone loss in this case. Um, one more, um, and I'm just going to run through uh, these cases because that's that's all I have left now. Um, uh, this was this this was done on a dentist this week. Uh, this was uh, this was an interesting case. Yeah, it, it took me a long time. There was a, there was a broken instrument in the MB2 canal. Uh, he eventually got it out uh, and sealed with a, a BIC sealer. Um, and uh, for another MB2 case, um, and uh, one more. So the MB2s are, 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 are very prevalent. I uh, had the, the privilege of taking part uh, in this worldwide uh, study uh, where we studied uh, uh, the prevalence of MB2s. Uh, and my sample of 250 CBCT scans was quite high. It was 95.6%. Uh, it was similar uh, to what was found uh, in, in England, uh, in Belgium, uh, in Syria, um, and even more recently in a, in a study in Saudi Arabia. But if we look at the overall global average, it's 73.8%. So, so what that means is that uh, it, it, in at least uh, seven or seven and a half out of 10 cases uh, that we see in our practices, uh, we should be finding uh, the MB2. Uh, internal resorption cases, uh, uh, the bioceramic uh, bi sealers work, uh, work beautifully in these cases here. Uh, thorough disinfection, uh, I, I like to use ultrasonic activation in these cases, uh, as well as the endovac, uh, and uh, uh, just injected a uh, single cone and the bioceramic bi sealer fills that space uh, beautifully. Um, this, this was an interesting case, uh, I just got a few minutes left. Uh, it was a trauma case, patient fractured uh, the anti and this was one of the first cases uh, that I used the, the BIOC sealer in uh, last year. I think it was in around about August or so. Uh, and um, yeah, this is, yeah, this was from my initial box. So when I took the x-ray, uh, you know, I, I could see I, there was a bit of movement 
Uh, but when I took the CBCT, you could see the fracture line was quite uh, far down. So in any case, I contemplated, I wanted to house and manage the case, uh, got some opinions from my colleagues. Uh, so some uh, recommended extrusion, um, followed by post crown. Uh, and so I was considering that um, my implant colleagues told me that it'll be difficult to get an implant in there. But um, well, at the, or at the time of treatment, I decided that I'm not going to take away that uh, that uh, fractured uh, piece. Uh, I, all I did was uh, I, I moved it aside, packed it with Teflon, uh, and, and I did the endo uh, through that. And uh, the the um, the bioceramic sealer actually it was a combination of the the martensitic files, uh, the the high flex files that allowed me to bend and enter at that angle uh, to, to clean out that canal, disinfect uh, thoroughly, and uh, a seal it with a bioceramic sealer. And, and at the end of the day, uh, uh, all I did was uh, apply uh, Pulfit Universal Bond and some composite, and I just bonded it back on. Uh, and, and this patient is fine uh, up until today. I, th I think I've got a recall with him soon. Um, uh, here's a here's a case uh, where I used uh, uh, Neo MTA Plus uh, as a bioceramic sealer. This was about a year ago. I wasn't using uh, uh, pure bioceramic sealers at that stage. I decided I wanted, so I just mixed it to a thin consistency, used it as a sealer, uh, and one year later, uh, you can see the bone grew back beautifully. Um, so this case, uh, okay. Uh, my apologies for that. All right, so the, this case uh, is actually a, a, a vertical fracture uh, in the distal root, um, and, and I could see it clearly with a microscope. Uh, and and this is actually a, a, a case I'm doing for my. This is a, this is my my brother's case, uh, and so so I thought let me just take a chance and see whether uh, MTA can do anything for vertical fracture because uh, a vertical fracture is usually uh, resigned to the bin. So. So what I did was I sealed the, 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 the front canals uh, with warm vertical compaction. I used EH plus, this was about a year ago. Uh, and uh, here I filled the entire canal with the uh, MTA flow. I just put in a skinny syringe and I just filled the entire canal. Uh, and if we look at the CBCT uh, that I uh, took uh, uh, post-op, you can see uh, the, the bone loss and, 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 and the, there you go here again, bone loss there distally. Uh, and one year later, you can see bone forming again. I'm not advocating it for vertical root fractures, but I, I took a chance in this case and it, it, it seemed to work uh, quite nicely. You can see the, the activity. So there's actually a huge difference between that and that bone has filled up quite nicely and, and he's completely asymptomatic. Um, and I'm gonna end off uh, with this case uh, this was a retreatment that I did uh, in the latter part uh, of the year. I think this was when I first started using bioceramic uh, bio or bio sealer. Um, basically, uh, the, this patient required a retreat. It was done, uh, but uh, to to understand, uh, uh, the, to to really appreciate the case, one needs to look at the CVCT. Uh, and if you look at the the pre-op CVCT, uh, we see that there was a mus canal buccally, a massive infection. Uh, and if we look at the six month healing, I saw this patient this week, uh, we can see complete bone formation. Uh, if, we, if, we, if we look at axial view, uh, there's bone loss here, bone full. If we, uh, if we look at the sagittal view, we can see uh, bone loss here initially and, and very nice bone full. So uh, I'd like to end off my presentation by saying that healing is actually the best reward uh, for me in these cases. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that very informative show. It's a lot of info to take in, but very well done. Thank you, Dr. Sida. Um, we had one question from Dr. Chetty, but you've answered it with the alcohol affecting the setting time. If there's any other questions, you can load them in the question column for us. Um, while we wait, I'll quickly share the promotions for the evening.
Dr. Sidat, you can see my screen? Yes, yes, I can see your screen. So the bio, we, we obviously sell Angulus, the BioC sealer, and it's been a hit so far. I think we've got our, our third order in um, that's coming in. We do currently have stock as well, but it's, it's been flying because of the change from um, or the, the change to uh, bioactive sealers. Um, you're looking at 1,899 Rand for 4.5 gram syringes. Uh, Dr. Sida, correct me if I'm wrong, but you said you get about five multi rooted molars out of one syringe. At least uh, five uh, out of one syringe. So that's uh, on average uh, three or four canals uh, per case. So I would say about, uh, you can call it about between 16. 20 canals uh, depending on how much uh, uh, is used uh, you know you can uh, i think with time you learn uh, how to use it more sparingly yes you know? and with your tip trick yeah <laughs> so i'm taking this opportunity quickly while i've got doc to see that but a very nice um gadget that's been added to the high flex range is the high flex remover and I've, we've received great feedback. So while I've got Dr. Sidat, I just wanted to ask him um, just to explain to you guys how he's using the iFlex remover. We moved from D1, D2, D3 files to one single file and not using a solvent. Exactly. So, so the iFlex uh, remover is used uh, at a speed of, I would say, not less than 500, so between 500 to 800 RPM. Uh, and it actually uh, it's it's got uh, an inactive tip, so it doesn't the risk of perforation is uh, is, uh, is is not there or quite low, uh, and and it actually it cuts into the central core uh, of your of your GP quite nicely. Uh, so it's the high speed with the friction uh, that that helps uh, grab that GP and 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 and, and remove it. Um, but you need to make a, a bit of a start with your your uh, twenty five uh, twelve uh, um, uh, instrument, your coronal uh, orifice orifice opener. Um, I I sometimes uh, uh, use it. Uh, there, there there's two there's two instruments that I, that I like for removing GP. One is this high flex remover, uh, and I, I like to finish off uh, with the um, uh, XP endo shaper. Because that that tends to snag uh, uh, GP that that I find uh, other instruments uh, they can't. Sometimes you just got that loose piece of GP inside a canal, and nothing you do can can grab it. Uh, and that and the endo XP shaper uh, 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 grabs it quite nicely. Uh, but the uh, high flex remover uh, works very well. Uh, just another a little tip uh, yeah, that I I found. I got two minutes left before I go on offline. Um, uh, I was, uh, when I struggle to remove uh, thermophil, um, I find that uh, I, I, I don't. I, I I've seen videos uh, with them using this uh, high flex uh, remover for it, uh, but I, I move a bit more cautiously. And then what I tend to do is uh, I use the high flex one file. So I use the high flex one file, and I find that it actually cuts a pathway uh, quite nicely alongside uh, the thermophil carrier. And when, when I reach around about two thirds of the canal, uh, I throw it away because uh, it, 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 it can break at that point because it's, it's quite a battle. So, and then I'm, I actually take out another one and make my way to, to, uh, to Apex. And then I use the high flex remover after that. Uh, and, and it uh, uh, pulls out quite nicely because it's got a 30 tip. Um, I forgot the taper, but seven, it can seven. have a 7% seven, seven taper. Uh, and, and it takes over after that. So that's just for my, my current uh, technique that I figured out uh, with, the, uh, with that horrible thermophil material. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, which, is the which is the nicest thing I can say about it. Perfect. So let me quickly say there's some more questions. Thank you for that, Dr. C. That it's a nice to have. Um, so the GP is only for retreatment options. Uh, you could flood the canal with BioC, like with your brother. Oh, uh, well, the, the, you you could, but then if you need to retreat, uh, it's uh, you, you're not going to be able to. So, so that that was just. I mean, look, I knew I had a, a vertical fracture, and I had a lost case. I mean, this, that that was going for an implant, 
and it was just a last ditch attempt you know to Okay, so the GPS only for oh, that one I've read. How fast does the cement set as soon as you place into the canal? One part. Oh, I think Dr. C, that's gone. ESCOM has said no more. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your attention this evening. Please keep on loading your questions. If there's any more questions, it will stay on the system and we will just email you the answers. Thank you, everyone. Good night.